Do you love wrestling? Do you love all elite wrestling? Make sure you check out the good, the bad, and the hungi here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. My name is Tyler Fornis, and my co-host Fred Moreland and I discuss all the happenings of all elite wrestling across the universe, including when they make trips overseas. We talk about Dark, we talk about Rampage, we talk about Dynamite, and everything in between, including... Tony Khan and his both brilliant and confusing booking. Make sure you check us out. We drop our shows on Thursdays to make sure that we keep up with Dynamite and make sure we give you all the current happenings um, in All Elite Wrestling. Hello, Voices of Wrestling listener. Dave Ryan here. Have you ever wondered to yourself how many hidden gems are hidden away inside the last years of World Championship Wrestling? Have you ever asked yourself how many tenuous gags can be made about the name Mike Enos? And have you ever thought about what it sounds like for two Irishmen to interpret a very chaotic company through its B-show? The answers to all this and more are just a click away. Check out Days of Thunder every second Thursday on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So far, Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for April 19th, 2023. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network feed or on our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you would like to donate to the show, just click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our, our redcircle.com landing site. You, you click the link that says sponsor this podcast. It's a red box. You set up a one time a recurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Mike Spears. Join alongside, as always, Case Lowe. In case, what is your favorite B League team? Oh, my goodness. There's so many to choose from. I, I, I couldn't possibly decide on just one of my favorite Japanese basketball teams. I have to, I have to throw that question back in your direction, Mike. I think as of today, it is the Toyama Grouses who had natu- had natural vibes out there doing party anthem before their game as a part of their overall uh, Toyama like Supermart matches that they've done lately. Part with our friends at the Luck Corporation. We, I saw you fired this tweet off today, Case. I've been kind of obsessed with this team ever since. Yeah, I, there's if you have not seen. The photos of natural vibes dancing at a basketball game, those are up on our Twitter account, at Open Voice Gate on Twitter. It seemed like a good time, and I hope this leads to a new boom period in Toyama. It's not a city that I'm int- intimately familiar with. I, I don't get the impression it's a city that Dragon Gate spends all that much time in. Maybe I'm horribly wrong, but as a, a quick search, it tells me they haven't run here uh, in a proper show since February uh, 2016. So... Yes, this is uh, exciting. It's fun stuff. I like when Drangate goes out and ventures outside of their bubble, and I always enjoy a good natural vibes dance. My other, my my second favorite B-League team, now as I have Wikipedia open, Earth Friends Tokyo Z. That's good stuff. I gotta gotta, gotta dive into the B-League and, more importantly, the uniforms that they wear. That's That's what'll pique my interest. Yeah, yeah, I gotta say Toyama, uh, the Grouses, red and white, you know, they, they keep it kind of simple, kind of reminds you of old school Rockets kind of vibe. I'm getting. Okay. 
Yeah. Do you, you remember? You know? Do you remember very early in the pandemic when there was no sports and ESPN was showing Korean baseball at like six o'clock in the morning? Yeah, the, uh, it, that's where you got to see the NC Dinos. Yeah, that was a dark time where I remember really wanting to follow the NPB that year and not being able to really find anywhere to stream games online and it being frustrating because I thought, well, you know, if I'm ever going to get into Japanese baseball, this is going to be the time to do it when there's no Major League Baseball going on. And that didn't happen. But ESPN2, I could hear Earl Hershiser announce a Korean baseball game from his apartment as I wake up at the crack of dawn. And it was just, oh, what what a dark time in humanity. Yeah, it, like ESPN, the, that was when they did the NFL draft year where everyone was at their houses. Yeah, Cliff Kingsbury was in his castle. Yeah, like that. that we should have known Cliff Kingsbury had different priorities when we saw that house, right? I'd like to know if he's still living there. That's, uh, you know, I, I, I would imagine, I know he landed on his feet, he's got another job already, but I would imagine he took some sort of salary cut. Well, well, you know what he did first after he got fired from the Falcons? Or not the Falcons, the Cardinals. Well, I Remind me, he did something weird. He immediately packed his bags and went backpacking in Thailand. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, I gotta say, I gotta be honest, that's not what I want from an NFL coach. I, I, it's the same, you know, Aaron Rodgers is an idiot, and I don't like Aaron Rodgers for a number of reasons, but my beef with him is always, he treats us like we're idiots because we don't do the things that he does. You know, in his mind, we're dumber for not going on darkness retreats. And if he was wacky about it, if he was like, ah, I'm a quirky guy, that's what I want to do. It would almost be endearing, but instead he, he treats himself like a top dog just because he's a weird guy. I don't, I don't need athletes being spiritual, finding themselves anywhere. I just need them nose to the grindstone. I know that's not very artistic of me. It's, it probably doesn't make me a good human, but I want them to be a little bit more machine than I do man. Yeah, it, you have to come by your weirdness naturally. It feels yes. very put upon with uh, uh, with Rogers, of Aaron Rodgers. Because like, you, Aaron Rodgers was kind of a normal, likable guy for about ten years, and then it just went away. Yeah, uh, maybe coinciding with his brother going on The Bachelor. Oh, I didn't know his brother was on The Bachelor. Oh, oh The Bachelorette. He won his season at Bachelorette. Really. Yeah, and like they made a thing of like, oh yeah, because him and his family did not talk before that, but like they made it very clear that Aaron would not be anywhere around it or around his family at that point. Interesting. All right, I just I remember his his relationship with Danica Patrick, and and after that, it he you know he's one of those people that that got full pandemic brained and lied about being vaccinated and then pivoted really hard into ivermectin, and and ever since then he has not been the same. Well, I mean, who was the actress that he dated, like, right before he got really out there? Was it Shailene Woodley? I I think so. I remember he was yeah. dating. Yeah, it was it was Shailene Woodley. Yeah, because I remember Shailene Woodley. Like before, like the alt science or whatever became a thing, she was big on drinking raw water from lakes. Good lord! So maybe Do you know that's who what. It, do you know who he's dating now? I thought he was dating the uh, daughter of the Milwaukee Bucks. Owner. Yeah, yeah, Mallory yeah. Edens, who, y yes, I have that name on lock and ready to go, but <laughs> I think she's my age, and I'm not here to shame age gaps. They're adults. For the most part, they can do what they want. It just, it just bugs me because she seemed like a net positive Nepo baby, and then she linked up with Aaron Rodgers, and now I hate her. I, you know, I look. I used to, I used to quite enjoy when TNT would show her on camera at Bucks games, and it's just not the same anymore. I, I I'm sorry that Aaron Rodgers personally inconvenienced you this much, buddy. I, you know, I, I, she grew up with money, and I can tell she did quite well for herself. But Aaron Rodgers is not the way to go. <laughs> I, I, I think that the Jets will learn that as well. Uh, which can we can we shit or get off the pot with that? Can he officially become a New York Jet? Because I am so entertained at the thought of 2023 Aaron Rodgers in the New York media market uh, away from the shelter that is Green Bay. Can we make that trade official finally? I mean, it's something. So my uh, partner's dad is a Green Bay shareholder. Ugh. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, like he has 
the, the, there's a lot of yellow foam in his living room mm. but it, 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 he 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 got very animated when i asked him about like don't they have to make the trade why isn't the trade happening and turn a different color when that when that happened i think it's green bay wants too much i guess yeah i i don't i don't know what the uh what the situation is there i just know i find it very hard to communicate with packers fans in real life yeah uh, they, they, they much like jimmy lloyd they're different is that what he goes by he was the different boy jimmy lloyd for the longest time oh that was God. his nickname Hey, real quick, I know we got a lot to talk about, and I know we're a day late in recording. I apologize. My girlfriend left for Paris last night, and I was not allowed to record a podcast last night, which, fair, I, I did have to take her to the airport, which I get. I love her. I was more than happy to do it. I was not allowed to record a podcast last night. Thus, we are here a day later. I do apologize for that. Tony Deppen, the man who supposedly, if you can't have a good match with Tony Deppen, you can't have a good match with anybody, despite the fact that I thought he, he brought Yamato down well below his level. I'm noticing a trend, and maybe it's just that no one actually watches indie wrestling. That that could go to this theory. Tony Deppen's in a lot of big matches. I see a lot a lot of match cards with Tony Deppen versus X established wrestler. I never see the fallout. I never see the hype. I never see the tastemakers that I trust going, "Hey, you need to watch this match." It's weird how that doesn't ever happen. Yeah, I. Uh- I I mean I feel like he's just like the house guy that everyone is like oh we we bring you in and you're, you're gonna face Tony Depp and so I think it's more that like he is just there and they know that he's not gonna like try to go do something insane. He in the last two months has wrestled Leo Rush, Samoa okay. Joe, Willie Mack, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put Willie Mack on this list because I think he's a very good wrestler, Jun Akiyama. Negro Casas, Hot Sauce Tracy Williams, and Shigehiro Irie. And I just don't hear anybody going, man, you got to watch Deppen versus X. It's just weird how that doesn't happen. Yeah, that actually, the, the way you, re- you read it off, that reminded me of like a 2017 like Euro trip for an American wrestler just facing a whole bunch of random people. Like that is a, a real assortment. I just feel like if you were, if you were the rest of the people thought you were, and you wrestled Negro Casas even at his age, and we're in a tag match with Jun Akiyama, and you got Irie, and you got Willie Mack in there. I feel like I would feel the need to check out one of those matches. I feel like I would I want to do that, and I feel like people would talk about them if they were worth a damn at all, especially Casas and, and Irie guys, and, and, and Akiyama rather, not, uh, not Shigehiro, but rather Jun Akiyama, guys that people love to put over, especially in that scene. A three-star, and I watched the match because I enjoyed the world on Lucha Show, didn't think much of Negro Casas versus Tony Deppen. And the people that are favorable to that brand and favorable to those wrestlers, awfully quiet on that one as well. Really strange how that works. Yeah, when that got announced, I was like, well, that makes sense, but I don't think that's going to be a hot little number there. And history has proved me right. Yeah, I don't know who... uh, from the GCW camp, I would have liked to have seen Wrestle Negro Casas, but it wasn't Tony Deppen. I know that much. Yeah, no. I I I I, I would want to see Irie versus Negro Casas, to be honest. I do like, by the way, uh, this last GCW doubleheader this past weekend. April 15th, Tony Deppen versus Shaza McKenzie. April 16th, Tony Deppen versus Shigehiro Irie. That is, uh, that, that is a difference in talent. Uh, no buzz on either match, but a, a noticeable difference in talent. Oh, that's a weekend, <laughs> all right. <laughs> that's a weekend. Uh, we have a lot of stuff we want to talk about this week, but Case, we were previewing it last week. We like to keep tabs on G-something here on the program. Gleet G Pro Wrestling version 49 Invader was from Corkin on the 12th. What a company this is. That's that's a nice way of describing it. I mean, we can start off off the bat and you know, this is a podcast look this week specifically, not going to be a lot of current Dragon Gate talk at the very end of the episode. We'll cover the weekend in Fukuoka, the matches we like, the things that uh, I, I have tabs on that I want to talk to Mike about. This is primarily going to be a Gleet podcast and a history of Dragon Gate podcast with our second topic. Next week, we will do a full Dead or Alive preview, which I'm, I'm really excited about because I think that card looks great. But we have to take some diversions this week. And given 
the names that are prominent in Gleed. I, I think it is fair that the Dragon Gate podcast spends an extended amount of time talking about some of their bigger shows and some of their bigger matches. And I, I gave you the over under last week. I think it was 800.5 fans over under on would they hit that or not. You went over with T. I, I thought versus- I went under. I thought it went under. You went under. You're right. You went under. I went over because I thought I thought they could crack a thousand with T Hawk versus Ashita, and they did 707 fans in yeah, Cork and Hall main event G Rex title match T Hawk versus Kaito Ashita, a G Infinity tag title match with uh, Chek Shimatani, our guy, and Hayato Tamora versus El Bendito and Flamita, your semi main event. 707 fans. What do you make of that number off the bat? I think that this this is a number that is not only indicative of Gleet, but it kind of shows you how the Dragon System populace has gone. And it, and that was one of the reasons why, in the back of my mind, I was kind of anti... I was under, because if you think about it, like these are guys who've been all over Dragon Gate, or at least making up a lot of this promotion has been strong hearts guys. They've already kind of settled after leaving dragon gate, like OWE, the action stuff appearing wrestle one DDT. Like they've done all their loops and I, I don't know how much legs that had. And at the same time, this Ishida as champion was like short spell and having this bad number, like outrightly bad number case, like, I think this kind of really puts a big uh, mark in the column that Dragon Gate is a draws as a brand more so than wrestlers anymore. Because one would think that Ishida in the past, like we, if we were talking about people leaving like a decade ago, we would talk about like fan clubs and stuff like that. And that's just not happening. You know, this is the perfect time to talk about this. And, and there's there's a number of different avenues we can go down. I think we should we should start with the Gleet versus Dragon Gate comparison in not necessarily one to one. You know, it's it's a little bit apples and oranges with these guys, just given the history and the longevity of the Dragon Gate brand compared to the newness of Gleet. There is the counter to make that, hey, you know, Toriumon is drawn from show one. And they've always been a consistent draw. Gleet has never really shown signs of that. But I, I don't know if this is on your radar as much as it is mine, but we're two weeks away basically from the five year anniversary of the OWE split. And I think it's really interesting looking at that and looking at the fallout again. I mean, five years is a long time. It's been five years since Shima has wrestled in Dragon Gate, five years since T-Hawk has wrestled in Dragon Gate for all intents and purposes, five years since Al Lindeman and Takahiro Yamamura have wrestled in Dragon Gate. That is a long time. And your big picture thoughts, Mike, this is what I kind of want to know before I break it down in a micro sense and talk about Dead or Alive 2018 versus Dead or Alive 2023. But on the OWE Strong Hearts Gleet side of things, how would you describe their last five years? Wilderness wandering. Yeah. I mean, like the story of OWE was that basically it was too small to succeed, but it also was probably the best chance. And it failed due to nothing on Strongheart's side. It failed due to just pure numbers. Like it, it failed that way and they, the path wasn't there for them. And that left them still wondering in Japan where OWE was really about to launch shows in Japan that probably if OWE wasn't going under, I don't think we'd be seeing this kind of gleet. It might be more like Ledet UWF and whatever Kaz Hayashi had going on, but we wouldn't be seeing something that very much, in case we've talked about this every time gleets come up recently, very much like the the vision here, and I'm not saying that it's primarily him, this is Shimaism. And this is something that now we've seen that after all of the promotion jumping, doing a little stints in places, that eventually th- that was going to have to run out. Like it maybe not for Shima, but for the group, it was the, they were going to need to sit down some roots. And this became the best option for them. And this is something where you have. The money from Ledet supposedly doing this. Uh, I 
when I was talking on stream today, my, one of my big points about this number is it's not like Gleet has a lot of different revenue streams. There's not like they have a TV deal. It's not like they have a streaming network. They put everything up for free on YouTube. And then you have to look at attendances. And it's like one of the th pure things because that's where the bulk of their revenue has to be coming from. And it's just does not add up and it hasn't added up from the start. And they also, they don't run a lot of shows and I don't know if that's helping them or hurting them, but I'm always kind of weirded out when I look at their schedule. Th there's just, there's not a lot of gleet going on, you know? Yeah. And it's something that, so for, l l let's uh, treat this like this could be someone's first real discussion about OWE and the split here. Uh, the, in the time where OWE Japan uh, kind of closed up right when COVID was happening, Shima did his own self-produced shows called Action that were first in a bizarre Osaka art gallery, but then he started doing outside shows, doing some stuff with Dove Pro. But it was a lot more Osaka and Western Japan based. Some of that might also be because Dove is a Hiroshima company. But it's something that when you look at Gleet and where they run, it's basically Tokyo, Osaka, Sapporo and Okinawa occasionally. It's not a real schedule. It is basically hitting the most populated cities, places where a lot of people who are the older people in this company have run for years. And then Sapporo is like the big outlier, which makes you think that maybe T Hawk is helping promote those shows, frankly. Yeah, I I think the the more evidence that piles in this should be a promotion that's based in Osaka and should, should spend their time focusing there. Because I, I don't think, I don't think Tokyo is it for them. You know, a cork and hall, which was once the friendly confines for everybody, I think has become an uphill battle really starting with, I, I say this and I don't mean to paint a, a negative light on it the way that it will sound, but the exploitation of cork and hall from new Japan and just the sheer amount of events that have been placed there over the last 10 years. And then you factor that in with, you know, again, the, the struggling, dare I say, dire industry that is just wrestling in Japan. And you see, hey, you know, Kaito Ishida's from Osaka. They sold out Osaka number two last time they ran there. And yet when they're in Tokyo, I am under the belief June Kasai is the biggest draw in Gleet history. You know, he headlined their biggest Cork and Hall show. They've done a few Tokyo Dome City Hall shows, but th those feel... You know, in the same way that you talk about Dragon Gate being uh, uh, the brand that uh, the the brand being the draw, those bigger Gleet shows feel like the brand being the draw. But these Cork and Hall stops, that October show was headlined by June Kasai and had the debut of Kaito Ishida. And as far as I'm concerned, those are the big draws there. But we've now seen diminishing returns with Ishida again and again and again. And it's something. So I'm just looking at the results right here. I'm just looking at the overall line about this it is something where at, at a certain point you have to run in tokyo like like i think that's a reality as much as someone who is not a native and someone in my position can say just the pure numbers are you have to run tokyo so it so that's always a thing there and it, it's something that every promotion comes across so can could this end up like how how osaka pro I don't think they really, at least this are con the, this incarnation, they don't go to Tokyo, but it's also at a much smaller scale. And I don't think with the people involved here, you can, uh, yeah, you'd be able to have them interested and involved if it was at that scale. I want to back up to Strong Hearts as a whole and five years after the split, and then kind of pivot to to where Drangate is at now compared to them. I, I will always defend the existence of Gleet on a few levels. I think the first thing you have to remember is, you know, OWE was this amazing idea on paper, and unfortunately, paper is the one that halted it from being anything. The logistical nightmare of it all, the legalities of it all, it just wasn't going to work no matter how hard people tried it. And Mike, I, I will always laugh, and I, I think we've talked about this publicly, the message you got from somebody, what, what did the message say when people were trying to get the OWE kids into AEW. So uh, I had someone. Yeah. Yeah. We have the distance. I could talk about this now. I think I've talked about this elsewhere. Anyways, there was someone who was involved in the international promotion side of OWE that was trying to find any way to get them 
visas, and this was 2019. Yeah. And this was, I, I, I mean, sadly, like the political context at that time, visas were not getting approved. Like we could talk about how there were issues for New Japan wrestlers getting visas in the United States, but it was doubly so when you are a Chinese wrestler. And I was contacted by this, the, the, this very auxiliary figure in the greater scheme of things. I don't want to misrepresent this person and their relationship, but they asked me, someone who uh, has zero legal background. And when I say zero legal background, the only time I've, I've had anything encountering law has been like medial law classes in school. And asked me, hey, Mike, can you help us with visas? And I just get, getting visas for Chinese performers to come to America, which again, relevant twenty nine twenty nineteen also. Yeah, teenage Chinese performers. So that was a no go. So yeah, you, you have yeah, yeah. you have and that conversation is <laughs> very very quickly right afterwards when I was like, looks like uh, quickly going to the Secretary of State Department of State website. Looks like uh, there's nothing that we could do here, nothing that I can do. I I suggest you talk to a entertainment lawyer not an archivist yeah so that that was a no-go there I, I think you know another asterisk that needs to be pointed out and this is something we talked about on the show at the time we had a little bit of a scoop with a z here the owe corkin show which i think was december 30th 2019 and i actually i want to pull up that card real quick just to to fully get my ducks in a row and make sure that I'm I'm representing this statement properly. But the thing so case okay, so before we get into this, yeah. I I do have like a caveat that I'm going to throw in that I discovered a couple months ago. Okay, so please. Something new about this, but continue. Just, just I'm going to I'm going to jump in at a point. Just preparing you for the hot tag. So so the idea was that OWE was going to run Cork and Hall December 30th, 2019, and we had heard Kenny Omega was supposed to be booked for the show. Others had heard it was supposed to be Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks that were booked for the show because this is still at a time where AEW was very much trying to be in partnership with OWE. This was their big Japanese Cork and Hall. I believe it was their Cork and Hall debut. And we thought those guys would appear on those shows. Logistics, to the best of my knowledge, got in the way, and that did not end up happening. Is this where you want to jump in? Yeah, so actually I found this. I, I was talking with someone involved in the situation after i wrote a post-mortem of owe after the news finally kind of came out through weibo chinese social media that owe for all intents and purposes dissolved was that the bucks allegedly allegedly kenny showed up at that one shinkiba show but he did that kind of freelancing oh, and wow. the buck they all wanted to do this and they were trying to get it to happen but it was probably not going to be okayed on one side but the the i i am still of the belief however that owe and strong hearts were booking this with the idea that the elite were going to be there and and i still think that's relevant to bring up because right would a, a one-off kenny omega appearance have sustained a company that was facing insurmountable odds no it would not but i think it would have given strong hearts themselves whether it be owe or whether it would have been gleed I think it would have given them name recognition that would have helped them, let's say, prosper for a longer period of time. I think that Omega Rub, Omega specifically, a massive star in Japan, undeniably in the scope of professional wrestling, I think that Rub wouldn't have just popped a house, assuming, and I remember watching that OWE show and, and enjoying it, you know, it was Takeshita versus T-Hawk is what they ended up doing, and then the six-man main event of Aben, who was one of the top OWE prospects, Aben, Lindemann, and Irie versus Sakamoto, Okabayashi, and uh, Yosuke Kodama. That alone, forgetting, you know, what I think it would have been Omega versus T Hawks and then the, the uh, T Hawk for, and then the Bucks doing something else. I think that would have sustained the brand a little while longer. So we, we have to factor that in as, man, the ball just didn't bounce in their direction there. And the other thing that I will always defend with the existence of Gleet is you have to remember Shima, T-Hawk, and Lindemann were fully prepared to move to Mexico in early 2020, get a massive push in, a in, in AAA, and also we were at a time in AEW programming where it seemed like Shima was going to be doing an angle with the Dark Order. So all of that gets shut down. They were essentially forming a, a, a global enterprise, a traveling international brand and in March of 2020, all of that came to a halt. And I, and I truly don't think 
when they were in Mexico in February of 2020, they thought, you know, we should get together with a money mark and with Kaz Hayashi and we should do Diet Dragon Gate in Japan. I think people would love that. I think this is the band-aid of all band-aids to cover the international wounds that were set in 2020. Yeah, and going back to the idea of what of what would happen if the if you had the elite on that show, if not for like providing momentum, that was a time where OWE Japan was basically from how I became became aware of like the individual things about it. Uh, from my understanding, it was basically Shima running with the former president Okamura's backing, and after that, after that tour, it was going to be purely OWE and Shima by itself that could provide it enough stimulus momentum there to make OWE Japan into its own whatever Gleet is at this level right now. Maybe not to that scale, but it would have provided them with a landing position that would have avoided some of the indignities, I would say, that I would say that strong hearts had because of COVID. You, you know, I mean, you laid out what was going to happen likely in February of 2020, and that's not, and the, it, things turned about as poorly as one could hope. Or one wouldn't hope one would. Yeah, what, it could, part, couldn't couldn't have gone worse for what they were planning. Right, and that was something that like they were always going to have an exit ramp back into Japan. Like I don't, I think they might have were in Cambodia at the beginning, very early, like in the establishment of the, uh, I think it was called Encore Warriors Bar that they did there. That that's where the OWE kids ended up. Uh, the, the the last real existence of OWE was in Cambodia, basically as a fight bar because it was cheap and they could make money and try to bring in cash somehow, but it didn't work out that way because of COVID. But I don't think Stronghearts ever really were planning on being in, in Cambodia at that point. I think like Mexico really was going to be the exit ramp. And I say all of that because one, I think it's interesting to go down memory lane again. Five years is quite a bit of distance. There are some people that might be hardcore Gleet fans that might not know this is how we got there. But, it, you know, the, this is the very short version of this is how Gleet came to be. And I say all of that because I want to be as fair as I possibly can. I want to say that I enjoy this promotion. Lindemann last year for me, a top 10 wrestler in the world. Kaito Ishida for me this year, certainly in my top 50, wouldn't blink an eye. I wouldn't think twice about that, rather. But this promotion, what is it? Who likes it? Seemingly nobody likes it in Japan. It It is box office poison. And I, I think we we have to be the ones to say the, the mismanagement of Kaito Ishida. Are you there with me and just... Yes, he's great in the ring. Yes, he's had a number of great matches this year. But as a persona, I am so turned off from Kaito Ishida right now. And this is kind of what he was doing at that at that period before he left the company. This seemed like what he wanted to be doing. Uh, you know, Ishida's departure last year obviously brought forth a ton of news. And the, I think the most widely publicized version of why he left was... Some combination of, you know, Yoshino retired and Kness retired and Shisa left and he didn't feel like he had anybody in his corner anymore in the company. And I, I push back against that as being the reason because I, I think the verbiage that is used in those specific names, I think is a little bit outdated. My understanding of uh, who had power and who didn't, and again, this is a very loose understanding, was it. It wasn't those guys. You know, it wasn't Shisa and Kness pulling as many strings as I think they got credit for in that scenario. I don't know why Ishida left. We knew he was unhappy for a long time. I don't know why he left. I know, what, when did he leave? June of last year? Nine months after the fact, I think he looks incredibly foolish in this scenario. I... I I don't see how this was a positive move at all. You know, he came into Gleed, and this is what I think is so interesting. He came into Gleed as an invader, but an invader that people wanted to love, and they quickly turned him heel. They had him link up with a Lucha unit, despite Ishida never wrestling in Mexico and really not having any sort of Lucha background. And then he loses the title, I think, after his first successful defense. He feels ice cold. 
I, I just, you know, th- this was going to be, this was going to be their calling card, you know, from a PR standpoint, Hey, they got one, you know, Ashita was a guy that challenged for the dream gate belt, had that incredible brave gate run, but was a great twin gate wrestler, a guy in the mix, a guy that people in dragon gate cared about and Gleek got one. And now, I mean, it, it is, it is the, you know, almost like free agency regret. I feel like if I was a sheet, I'd be trying to get out of here because I think they've completely mismanaged him in six months. And it's something who he they mismanaged him with and how they mismanaged him. I mean, he comes in, he looks like a house of fire. He gets a pretty instant title shot against Linda Men, loses that first one, wins a battle royal to get a shot in his hometown, wins the title there, gets the defense against Kazma, and then loses to T-Hawk. T-Hawk case. Who I'll say this before we like uh, just as like a minor j- just side trip here. This was my favorite T Hawk match. I feel like since he left Dragon Gate, like this was the T Hawk that if he showed back up in 2015, we not might not be talking about Glee right now. Like I'm glad that- you said that because I went four and a half stars on this match. I thought it was awesome in a vacuum. That's become my issue with Glee. Everything in a vacuum I enjoy, but once you zoom out even a little bit, that bird's eye view is terrifying. Yeah, and, and it's something that I I sh- sh- should I, should I drop this take now? Should I do it now? I look, I lo- Mike, I love when you have a hot take because you get so excited about it, and I I would hate for you to hold on to it any longer. Please drop the splitting atom of your gleet take. All right. Uh- you know what Gleet really is when we boil it down? What's that? Japanese Circle Six. Now, I'm certainly aware of the existence of Circle Six, but I am famously not a pervert, and I, I admittedly don't know a ton about Circle Six. Can you draw out that comparison for me? It's 440, and a lot of people run off from GCW that seem to, like, for various reasons, left that company, and it does not always seem to be amicable. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, here's why. And it's not ring style whatsoever. I mean, we're talking about New Sense Pro Wrestling with Glee Case. My favorite part about every entrance uh, is there is the start video where it then, like a minute, almost at the end, it says, New Sense Pro Wrestling, Shima. I'm like, yep, <laughs> I know what I'm here, here for. But w- one could see Circle Six as a result of a, I don't know, political game, or as people on the way out starting their own thing i look at it as like oh that kind of reminds me of how strong hearts left the company and whatever reason and now they have their own small promotion ladette we know that they that they promote shows but as we talked about before this has to be a company that's burning an insane amount of money here where's that money coming from who knows what circle six money comes from who's behind all that and uh you have uh, a booker putting over a star that did not get put over in their previous promotion, Atticus Kogar versus T Hawk. Yeah, I look uh, with my limited knowledge of Circle Six. You certainly explained it in a way there that makes total sense, and that's that. That's what Gleet has become, and and I think the purpose of this segment. I want to be clear. For me, it's not to dump on Gleet. I want this promotion to succeed because they book. El Lindemann, they book Kaito Ishida, they book Flamita, they might be the Japanese helm of Commander, at least they were. I could very easily see him uh, finding a way into Super Juniors this year, but that's besides the point. I would it's love home of Ochi Shiba. Home of, home of Ochi Shiba, who could forget? <laughs> home of Czech Shabatani, who could forget? But. Jan's family? Uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> I, I, I would love a second healthy junior promotion as somebody who obviously covers dragon gate and has learned more so than ever over the last year. And I, I, I say this and, and you know, perhaps this will be gross, but just as, as the business of this show, you know, dragon gate can have as many great matches as they want. We learned last year through the Dave Meltzer stuff. People are going to care so much more about the backstage drama and the jumps and the rumor mill than they are any form of wrestling. And if this promotion was competitive with dragon gate, I think Dragon Gate would start doing a lot of weird things, and I think that would be exciting for a promotion that has largely been the same for 24, 25 years, minus a few key moments in history, one of them being the OWE split. It would be great for Japanese wrestling, a scene that is in such poor shape. If there was a, a second junior-focused promotion 
that was healthy that in this state could draw a thousand fans to Cork and Hall on a regular basis, but they're just not. And at some point, we have to have that conversation, and that's why we're having it now that you and I might enjoy the top level matches. But I said this last week, and it remains true after watching this Cork and Hall show. I don't know what this promotion is. It's kind of X Dragon Gate guys. It's kind of UWF guys. There's some really exciting young guys that don't ever seem to to penetrate the larger viewing audience. This promotion is basically black generation versus everybody else, which doesn't work for me at all. You know, I, I don't understand the booking that goes in here. I don't understand the units. I just know that Kaito Ishida is a heel and he's wrestling with luchadors. And yes, it's good in the ring, but God, is it inaccessible to me? I, I don't know what it is about this promotion. I want to like it and I want it to succeed. And I feel like, it's not that they're taking one step forward, two steps back. It's that with every step they take, they're shooting themselves in the foot. And I don't know how much bone they have left to spare. Yeah, and I know I have more of a stomach for it than you do. But, like, the whole uh, Ledette UWF, th like, thing has been... I, I think you have to look at it as a outright failure in a lot of ways. I mean... It looks like they're booking Shinya Aoki to beat their best home ground UWF wrestler yet again, right? Like, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. He Aoki is going to beat my main man Takanori Ito, and I'm going to be bummed. But then he's going to go put on the he's going to put on the apron and go hang out with Yosuke Kadama. So I'm okay with that at the the other side here. But the the thing is, is that y you would think that their homegrown stars, and yes, they now have trainees, and they made a post about it. We'll, we'll see who sticks with it. But you would think that your Itos, your uh, your Tetsuya Izuchi's, your guy, who completely is as cold as cold can be after a bad Ledette UWF MMA idea. Like, they, I think the problem might be that there's just too many influences in this and they should just let someone who maybe just let Shima cook and let him handle all of it because w why should someone be a 60 Seconds fan, Kate? I have no idea. That's, I mean, that's what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. I, I don't know. I love Jun Tancho. I think he's yeah. great. But why should I care about him with the way that they get jobbed out to Black Generation? No, I mean, it, he would almost be a very nice success story. You know, he was a, a young boy who Shima took a, uh, took a liking to in Wrestle 1. And, you know, that promotion fades away. And he kind of hangs out in oblivion for a little bit. And I, I would look at him as a guy where you could say, you know, he was... He was a nobody until he found Gleet, and now he's a guy. And there's just, there's none of that. Again, the the promotion has become, here are some guys you liked in Drangate. Check them out here. And I think in the case of El Lindemann, again, I, I, I will always defend the existence of Gleet because in 2022, El Lindemann got to be the wrestler that I always knew he could be. And part of that was his work in the Super Juniors, the Super Junior Tag League, but also he was a top 10 wrestler in the world last year. And that's because he was a damn fine wrestler in Gleet. He put this promotion on his back, and I thought every one of his title defenses was must see last year. He was excellent. But once you get past, once you get past Lindemann, it's Ashita who has cooled off, and it's Shima who I'm always going to have an unhealthy relationship with, but he's on the shelf right now, and it's T Hawk. And if you come into this, let's say you're an All Japan Pro Wrestling fan. T-Hawk might be exciting to you, and I get that, because again, the guy can have great matches. But five years post-OWE split, his stock is in such a bad position simply because of how Dragon Gate persisted without him. And Case, now he is G-Rex champion, but how many times, and not just from like our talks, but how many times independently through... Your little, your little spiders, you know, dark Twitter, however you want to call it, the DMs. Did you hear the rumor that T-Hawk might be getting out of wrestling soon? Because I heard it multiple times. I, I was thinking about that this afternoon because I remember so somebody reported that once that he was looking to get out of wrestling, and I know that person didn't hear it from the same person we had heard it from. So it's it's a pretty sustained rumor, you know, from multiple circles of people that talk to uh, the Japanese industry at large. It's its not a secret, seemingly, that T-Hawk has been looking to bail. And, you know, again, All Japan keeps booking him. He's no longer in DDT, and I would love to know why. I know we have people that listen to this podcast that are more plugged into DDT than I am, and especially that you are, but 
when Stronghorse showed up at DDT, I thought, okay, this is where they're going to be. And they never seem to really value Lindemann the way other promotions have, but they value T-Hawk and they valued Shima. And I thought that would be the landing spot. And instead they got bounced from DDT. And I think that has hurt their overall image a lot. DDT was very good for Stronghearts. And I thought Stronghearts were very good for DDT. And the the real decline of that relationship has, has come, or I guess rather the decline of the image of Stronghearts in my mind has been partially just because they no longer work those shows. Yeah. So, uh, assuming that, with our assumption that we have, that who does a lot of the booking there, why, when you've seen El Lindemann, who, in the ring, success story, as you're saying, but when the box office doesn't lie, was not what you would call someone knocking them dead or building momentum for this company. This is a company that did a little better with him as champion, but a lot of that was like Jun Kasai and Outsiders bolstering it. So you go to T-Hawk. Do you think maybe it's something that the fans that were there for Strong Hearts initially, do you think they're tired of El Lindemann and T-Hawk? Because imagine if you are someone who just maybe got into this promotion because you're a Kaz Hayashi fan. You've been a Kaz Hayashi fan since 1994. Wouldn't you kind of get the idea of, well, why should I care about anyone other than Strong Hearts? And when, as we've seen, there's verifiable data, strong hearts aren't really working to like make this into a promotion where that we think is healthy. No, and and that's where you know we have to go back in time and remember that when strong hearts split from Dragon Gate, they're the only thing that's ever drawn in Wrestle One. I went back today and looked at some Wrestle One Cork and Hall attendance numbers. They spike, or rather, they peak when T Hawk wins the the heavyweight title. And once T-Hawk loses that title, which is mid-2019, they never recover. I mean, some of the, the Wrestle 1 Quirka numbers in the middle and back half of 2019, they would be bad pandemic numbers. And this is 2019 when, you know, people could still easily put in 15, 1600 in Quark and Hall. So they were a draw there. They were a draw in DDT. You know, I, I don't know if anything post 2017 ish has really ever been considered a draw in Big Japan, but they they ran there and, and you know did their thing again. You know, they they were slated to be uh, ideally draws in Mexico, but this kind of comes down to the crux of the issue: strong hearts aren't drawing in Gleet. The name value of the brand means nothing, and the young guys I don't really think are given a chance to shine because they're kind of under the strong heart shadow. And so you just have this promotion that is simultaneously everything and nothing. And it's a frustrating watch if you invest any emotion into it whatsoever. But I have to say, though, I did enjoy watching this show <laughs> but because you're absolutely right. I Maybe I'm so detached then. I, I, I would have to say that we, we do have our inherent biases. And I know for a long time with Galit, for me, I was very hands off with and that's still something that I'm working to overcome, but it was like, I like the UWF stuff. Like Hikaru Sato got messed up in that, 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 that was fun. And you got to see Galino Del Mall. I mean, he's a big boy and that was fun. Yeah. There, there was fun stuff in this promotion. It just, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. I guess that's almost my cry for help. And I would love for people on the voice of wrestling discord to, to come into the open, the voice gate channel. And, you know, I, I don't want to turn it into a fantasy booking thread, but I'm curious yeah, to know. No if, fancy booking. <laughs> I'm curious to know if, if people understand where we're coming from on Galito, if, if we're coming down uh, like like Debbie Downers, because uh, yeah, it's fine. Four and a half star main event. Kaito Ishida and T Hawk, awesome, best T Hawk match in years. But once the bell rings and T Hawk gets the belt, who gives a shit? They ran a produce show for Black Generation Shinkiba first ring two days later and didn't sell out Shinkiba first ring. I, yeah, I, I don't. I, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with this promotion. It, it's. I guess this is the larger point. I want to pivot to Dragon Gate a little bit because, like I said, we're five years removed, essentially, from the OWE split. And so what I did, Mike, and, and follow along on this exercise with me, I took all of the guys that are in title matches at this year's Dead or Alive. Again, the full card is out. We'll give it a big preview next week. Spend plenty of time on it. But the full Dead or Alive 2023 card, I looked at the guys in title matches, and I compared them with where they were at at Dead or Alive 2018. Do you follow that? Right, yeah, I'm with you. Okay, all right, so so we'll, we'll go through the list here. Jason Lee, 
Open the Brave Gate champion. He's going to defend his belt at Dead or Alive 2018. He was in the Open the Triangle Gate championship match as a very clear loss post, and he lost uh, maximum the belts against Natural Vibes. Would you say in 2023, Jason Lee is in a better position than he was five years ago? Absolutely so. Very much so. His challenger is Dragon Daya. Mike, five years ago, Dragon Daya had not yet debuted, so he is in a better spot. Uh, yeah, undoubtedly, yeah. I mean, Dragon Daya has, if you want to talk about five years, that is someone that, if you want to listen to some 20, 1980, or 2018 audio, not the most fair person to Dragon Daya. He, I would say probably out of the people you're about to mention, the biggest jump. Well, that this is this is going to be a reoccurring trend is the guys that are in title matches that hadn't yet debuted by the time OWE slipped because the next guy on the list, one of the Open the Triangle Gate champions, is Kota Minora. And Kota Minora had not yet debuted when the OWE split happened. Yep, he would debut like two months <clears throat> later. Very much so. Ben K, well, also one third of the Triangle Gate champions. Ben K, of course, by this point, uh, had challenged for the Dream Gate belt. He won the Twin Gate belt at Dead or Alive 2018. Now he's coming into the show as an Open the Triangle Gate champion in 2023. Do you think Ben K's in a better spot than he was five years ago? Yes, but it took us a while to get there. There was, it, it got much better, much, uh, uh, much better very fast, and then it got much worse very fast. And now I think he's at the best stage in his career. Uh, the, yep. It, it, it's a little up and down. You know, it's like one of those pre calc waves that I never learned. <laughs> uh, BB Hulk is also defending the Triangle Gate belts. He was in the opening match, an eight man tag as part of Tri Vanguard in 2018. I think BB Hulk is roughly in the same spot that he was five years ago. Yeah. And it's something that. His he's been at this level pretty much since 2017. So yeah. After that, let's talk about the uh, the challengers real quick on this triangle and this uh, exercise for the triangle gate belts. KZ he won the triangle gate belt at Dead or Alive 2018. That was the big natural vibes run with him and Genki and Susumu Yokosuka. He is once again in a position where he's challenging for a title in this match, but I think the profile of KZ from Natural Vibes 1 to now we're in Natural Vibes 3 has been greatly elevated. Right, yeah, I mean, we, we saw that last year when Sasumu and Kinky left, that it was like, yep, Natural Vibes at that time, that iteration was KZ getting to that level, and now it's KZ bringing people up to his level. Big Boss Shimizu on this team as well. 2018, he won the Twin Gate titles alongside Ben K. Now he is challenging for the Triangle Gate belts. I think Shimizu's in the same spot that he was five years ago. Yeah, because he already had a Dream Gate shot at five years ago, right? Yeah, I think he, I think it was a Wakayama match, but I think you're right. So, you know, he's reestablished this. If we were talking last year, I'd say he was down, but, you know, he, he's gotten back up there. Strong Machine J, the last guy in this Triangle Gate match. Strong Machine J had not debuted yet. Now he's wrestling for a title. Didn't know he existed. Did it, and, and, and boy, would I have liked to. It would have made his debut press conference a lot less scary. <laughs> After that, let's talk about the Twin Gate match real quick. Shuji Kondo and Kano will kind of lump them in together. Guys that were not in the company at the time. I think Kondo is an interesting one to look at because there's a chance that if Strong Hearts don't leave... He never comes back. Would I rather have L. Lindemann than Shuji Kondo? Yes, but I also think Kondo overall is a net positive for the company. Yeah, and that's also healing old wounds. Like, you can't really measure the Aganisu kind of fissure. Like, is it completely healed? Who knows? But, you know, that, that you, you know, settling business, you know, like doing things. That, that, that was a relationship that needed to be mended, and I think that has to be taken into account somehow. I'm with you there. So we look at the challengers here. There's Ishan, who had not debuted yet. And then there's Kai. And he might be the most interesting name on this list to look at because he came into the company in August of 2018. And, you know, we've kind of spent a lot of this podcast disparaging Stronghearts, but myself in particular, when they split from Dragon Gate, I was so down on Dragon Gate. And for me, 2018 and part of 2019, it was so much more exciting to follow Strong Hearts wherever they were going. And that was because, you know, they made Wrestle 1 interesting and they made DDT more interesting. And here they were going international. And also because Dragon Gate was booking Kai. And I've never liked Kai and I didn't want him in my Dragon Gate. And I think his success is such a representation of the overall ideology shift to where 
you don't have to be a true bred Lucha Resu wrestler and you don't have to be magnitude Kishiwada. You can come from the outside and have great success here. And I think Kai at this point, and I've said this a number of times over the last six months or so, I think Kai has become underrated. And I think his ability to adapt to Dragon Gate while staying true to what makes him him and what brought him to the dance should be absolutely applauded. He is in a better spot than he was five years ago. This is the best run of his career. Yeah, and it is something that you look at where he was before Dragon Gate, and yeah, it's easily someone who massively jumped their stock. And then you have the main event. You have Shun Skywalker, who was in an opening eight-man tag. It was uh, specifically, it was Gamma, Kaito Ishida, Problem Dragon, and Shun Skywalker versus BB Hulk, UT, Hyo Watanabe, and Yuki Yoshioka. That was the opening match of Dead or Alive 2018. I think we would agree Shun is in a better spot than he was five years ago. Absolutely. Yep. And Madoka Kakuta, who hadn't yet debuted. It, it, the, the, the point of this exercise is ultimately history is written by the victors. And in 2018 and 2019, it seemed like Shima had won yet again, that the Japanese Jeff Jarrett was one step ahead of everybody and people didn't realize it. And as time has gone on, we w- went through the pandemic, Dragon Gate has won this battle from a perception standpoint, from a business standpoint, and from an in-ring standpoint. On this show, Dead or Alive 2023, they have one, two, three, four, five, six wrestlers, if we count Kai, six wrestlers in title matches who had not debuted in Dragon Gate in 2018 when the OWE split happens. The health the seeming build to longevity that Dragon Gate has created, it is remarkable. And they are seeing that in the Dead or Alive 2023 card, which again, we'll preview next week. But what a remarkable looking show on paper. Yeah, and it's something that I, I, as you were laying this out, Case, I had, I don't know if this is as mind-blowing as Gleet is the Japanese uh, Circle Six, but... I wonder, and and this is one of those things that we have to get some boots on the ground to figure this out, Kiss. I wonder how much of Gleet's fan base actually was aware of Strongheart's history before that, because I don't think there is. You know, how much of Strongheart's fans or Gleet uh, are unaware of that? Like, I don't think they're making new fans. You you think the Gleet fans are people that were Strongheart's fans that have just followed them wherever they've gone? I th- when I look at this uh, Invader showcase and sitting through it, it's not like 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 I'm not dis- besmirching like Minoru Tanaka, where I don't think that Minoru Tanaka is bringing people to the building. I just look at this promotion and a lot of the pieces here, and I don't see how there's a path forward to growing new fans. L- like I feel like you kind of have to be so reliant on the Dragon System Pass for a lot of that, and that makes the Ledet UWF stuff stick out even more. Okay, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, just want, I want to make sure I was on the same page as you. I, I'm, I'm with you there. You know, look, we love Czech. We really like Jun Tancho. Th- these guys are, are not drawing fans to the building, and I don't know if they're being put in a position to, but it could be a chicken and egg thing there. All I know is that over the last five years, you know, Drangi took a real hit uh, from a, in, at least in the English speaking world. And we saw attendance drop off when, when strong hearts left, you know, they, they took a hit business, uh, from a business perspective. And now, you know, new Japan remains top dog and rightfully so. And no one is in their universe. And I still looking at, looking at numbers, you know, not fighting with emotion, but looking at data rather, uh, Dragon Gate remains the number two promotion in the country. And I think they've set themselves up to have a, a remarkable back half of the decade. Dare I say, I would agree. I would agree. Case, we've been talking about five years in the past. Let's talk about something that will be very soon celebrating its 20th anniversary, Case, as you... I I, I don't know about the scheduling about this. So I was trying to do a smooth transition, Case. Let, let, let's talk about El Numero Uno 2003. Yeah, so Friday morning at VoicesOfWrestling.com, I think it's going to come out at 10 o'clock Eastern Time, 9 o'clock Central Time. Uh, I have written a a very extensive article on the career of Genki Horiguchi and specifically the night of April 22nd, 2003, the finals of the El Numero Uno tournament, which if you know anything about the history of Torimon, 
that is the night that Genki Horiguchi became a star. And the legacy and the image of Horiguchi has largely all been cultivated even 20 years after the fact. You know, this year, or this week rather, was one of his 25th anniversary homecoming shows. It's all based on El Numero Uno 2003. So I spoke with Genki Horiguchi through a translator. I interviewed him for this article. I interviewed a number of people, some of whom have who have worked alongside him, some people who are merely uh, longtime fans of either him or Toriyaman and Dragon Gate themselves. Uh, if you liked what I did with the Masato Yoshino piece when he retired 18 months ago, this Horiguchi article is is very very similar uh like i said it's it's quotes from genki himself uh and and thank you uh, if the person is listening the person that helped set up that interview thank you very much for that it, it went yeah, it was great and uh, you know i was able to get quotes from genki horiguchi which is a, a pleasure uh again people that have worked alongside him there's also a number of quotes he did an interview uh for the pure riso today youtube channel in early 2022 and I paid somebody who is a fan of this podcast and who lives in Japan. I paid them money. I said, will you please translate this entire interview for me? It's uh, about 45 minutes worth of content, and it seems really revealing and super interesting. And, and it largely touches on how he became a wrestler and then some of his philosophies, let's say. You know, he doesn't really talk about much of his career. It's sort of his training and then natural vibes, and that is really it. But it was an eye-opening interview that I've been sitting on for a long time now, and I, I didn't really know what to do with it. And as we approach the 20th anniversary of this show, I realized, okay, I now have a chance to use some of these quotes to sort of paint a picture of Genki Horiguchi. I talk about how his mother, you know, basically broke out in tears when Genki told her that he wanted to become a professional wrestler, laughed at Genki when he failed his first entrance exam. He, he tried to become a student at y uh, Yoshioka, Yoshioka Yatsu's Social Pro Wrestling Federation. He failed his entrance exam. His mother laughed at him. And then he found out that he could go to Mexico for Ultimo Dragon and basically said, see ya, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do this. Uh, and I talk a lot about his savviness. You know, he was the one of the Torimon guys that really picked up on learning Spanish and embracing the culture and... Although it doesn't fit with the full theme of the article, I want to tell the story here, but it's in the article as well. At Speedstar Final, oddly enough, he's getting ready to go out and defend his Open the Brave Gate Championship against Kagatora. And somebody from Gaiora basically tugs on his sleeve as he's getting ready to make his entrance and says, hey, we need you to translate Diamante's promo right now. And he's like, can I do it later? Like, I'm about to, about to go out for a match. They go, no. The video package won't get done unless you translate this right now. So as he's making his entrance, essentially, he runs to the back, listens to the interview, translates what Diamante says, and then comes out there and has a match. And, and that is an overall theme of Genki Horiguchi's career. He's everywhere all the time. He's constantly working. He's constantly doing things for Dragon Gate to enrich the brand. And the best night of his career was April 22nd, 2003. And Mike, I'll pass it to you real quick. Uh, what, what are your memories of Horiguchi, you know, at El Numero Uno 2003, one of the more legendary shows in the history of Torimon. I I think that, like, before getting into the shows, we're talking about where he was in his career, in a way, because he was the lost post in a lot of ways for M2K after having a very short uh, babyface run. And it was something that throughout, like, in the lead-up to this, it was something that Ginky was just kind of this very charismatic but annoying character and the the time frame and the machinations i'm not able to recall exactly this time but it basically created a scenario where el numero 2003 was done a lot more like how modern king of gates are where there was a last chance battle royal and like this and he got in through that and then through the rest of it he was able to summon the backslide and this is where the backslide from heaven came from yeah, so, you know, something that I, I hadn't really realized until I dug into this tournament, Masato Yoshino, who obviously at the time all caps Yoshino, goes undefeated in block play. He taps out Shima the opening night. The next night, he wins the NWA Welterweight Heavyweight Ch or the, the Welterweight Championship from Genki Horiguchi. The belt was vacant. It was supposed to be Yoshino versus Darkness Dragon. Believe it or not, Darkness Dragon got hurt. So they do Yoshino versus Genki. He taps out Genki. 
And then he runs through everyone in his block and taps them out. And so this tournament is kind of built up for Yoshino to be the star. And he wins his opening round match, but then he loses to Shima in the semis. And at that point, the obvious direction seems to be Shima versus Mochizuki in the finals because Mochizuki at the time was the leader of Shin M2K. Shin M2K was struggling and you can always go to Shima versus Mochizuki. And I think that would have raised the profile of the unit. And instead what you have happen is in the opening round, uh, Genki, well, Genki starts the show by winning the battle Royal, which he was, he was very happy to remind me, you know, I asked him, I said, what was it like wrestling three matches in one night? And he goes, it was four. I also wrestled in a battle Royal and fair game to Genki. <laughs> uh, and, and these battle Royals, I mean, the, the collection of wrestlers, because this was after, this was like the first, like real blending with T2P. Like this yes. was the first El Numero of that. Is it, so it's like Taru, Toru Awashi, just like, th- th- this is not like a very quick Kobe Sambo. No, this was a, it was the longest match on the show. It was, you know, about 20 minutes in length and Genki and Susumu are the two guys that come out of this battle royal as the survivors. And so Genki comes into the first match against Magnum Tokyo, who had won El Numero Uno the year prior. Three minute match. Genki beats him with a backslide. Oh my God, what's going on? Okay, well, that was fun, but surely he'll lose to Masaki Mochizuki. Two minute match, Genki backslide from heaven. What the fuck is happening? Now that you're telling me the main event of the show is Shima versus Genki, and the, the four block matches that they had combined maybe went 10 minutes because all of the undercard matches on this show are under five minutes for whatever reason. And then you get into this scenario where it's Genki versus Shima in the main event. And again, Genki Horiguchi is a guy on the roster, yes, but a, a nobody in the grand scheme of things versus Shima headlining a massive pay-per-view in front of almost 6,000 fans and the crowd sides with Genki and you get these Hage chants that just echo throughout the building and it really looks like throughout this match and I, I recommend watching it if you've never seen it. The main event is on the Dragon Gate Network. I don't understand why the entire show isn't, but the main event Genki versus Shima is and there are so many great near falls in this match where it looks like Genki is going to beat Shima and so the Hage chants, which went over to uh, America and Europe whenever he was over there, the backslide from heaven, really just the aura of Genki Horiguchi. It all stems from this one night. So again, just to sort of plug my shit real quick, it's an article that explains how we got to El Numero Uno 2003, the hardships he went through in training, et cetera, et cetera, this night, and then the overall legacy, the lasting impact of this one show, because you know, you can look at a career of a guy like Shingo and go, well, he had this, this, and this, and, you know, he got better as time went on. He had these great matches, all this, that, and the other thing. With Genki Horiguchi, it's one night. It's he had this one match, this uh, this one show, rather, he wrestled three times in singles matches, one time in a battle royal, and the rest of his career has been based off of this one night. And it's a great thing for everybody to witness. Uh, so I, I don't know if I did a great job of selling this article, but I'm very proud of it, and I hope people read it on Friday when it comes out. Yeah, there's a reason why this is a lot more memorable than the fact that he won King of Gate 2012, even though he tried to remind us for years afterwards that he was a King of Gate winner. Love the tank top. It was a it, it was a great thing. Like in 2014, it's like King of Gate 20. Uh, that tank top lasted him for a while. Yeah, it was great. It was, it was outstanding. But, it, you know, even King of Gate 2012, he beat everybody with the backslide. It's the same thing that he did in El Numero Uno 2003, just nine years later. You know, it was... Uh, it was very much an homage to to this one evening. So it was a lot of fun. Again, uh, thank you to Genki for having a conversation with me, and thank you to everybody who who gave me quotes. There's, uh, you know, Mike is not quoted in this article. I, I reached out to a lot of people uh, that I, I've never spoken to for articles before. Yes, there's some Alan Forel quotes in there, but it wouldn't be my writing unless I stole Alan's opinion at some point. But other than that, it's it's a lot of new names. It's quotes from Genki. And it's a good time. So I encourage everybody to read that on Friday. I I think it's going to be worth your time. Yeah, it's a really cool piece. Okay, Scott, let me preview it. And yeah, if you like the uh, Speed Star retirement piece, then this is going to be right up your alley for I I will say, Mike, it's much longer than when you read it. I I, I would say it's it's probably another three or four pages since the last time you had eyeballs on it. (laughs) So, so, So I'm someone who has writer's block for the last few months you're just cranking out a thousand words like it's not i really you know i i wrote sort of an extended dragon gate cork and hall preview piece in january 
I forget. Well, it, maybe it was the Shunan and Kakuta review. I did something in January and I said, you know, I'd like to do a column every month this year. And I had something really cool lined up in February, but it involved, unfortunately, interviewing wrestlers. And I think, one, they're just bad at getting back to people. And two, I quite frankly think I spooked them with some of the questions that I was asking. And I think people were like, eh, I, I, I don't want to reveal all this information. So I had to pause in, in, in uh, February, but in March, I did the Michinoku Pro piece. In April, I have this coming out. I have ideas for May and June already. And then as we get into the summer, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, retrospective stuff, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years stuff that I think is worth revisiting that is not specifically Dragon Gate related. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of writing that I want to do this year, but I, I think it's very important that somebody like Genki Horiguchi, his story is told uh, to an English speaking audience that can appreciate it. And I, I would say this will not be the last long form Dragon Gate piece that I do this year. So hopefully people enjoy it again. It's it's very similar in structure and in tone to the Yoshino article that I wrote a few years ago, which I you know I was uh, very flattered by the the feedback to that. I hope people enjoyed this as well. So that will be up at Friday, uh, I believe, at ten Eastern on VoicesOfWrestling.com. All right, yeah, I can't wait to see what you added to it. Should we talk about Fukuoka? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so they had their traditional day night double header across Fukuoka this last week. It's all. You know, we're we're firmly now on the road to Dead or Alive. It's something where coming out of the show, again, as Kay said, we'll talk about and we'll preview uh, the full card next week. But everything's pretty much set for Dead or Alive. And this, so for me watching these shows, at least f- as I watch them, I was wanting to see how they were going to add things to these matches, to these programs that have been pretty firmly set. And the one program that they've really continued building towards, we had the second part of in Fukuoka with the SSW Quest second game. This was on the this was on the evening show. Uh, the show was on the 16th. It'll be up on the network till the end of this month, till the 30th, with the SS Quest game two, Decourage Exploding. And the repercussions thereof. Case, how are you feeling about uh, SSW Quest as we enter its second game? I don't know if we have stuff for SSS, SS Quest for next week. No, I don't think so because it's it's small it's small spot shows next week. You know, I would be very surprised if there's another evolution of the story. Quite frankly, I don't think they need it because I think the two SSW Quests that they did, obviously the handicap match of Zebrats versus Kakuta last week, and then in Fukuoka this past weekend. Kakuta versus Daya versus Yoshioka, the decourage three-way. I think they they hit it out of the park here. I think this was a really interesting way to get to this match. It kept me really invested in Kakuta. I think the handicap match versus Zebrats was a little bit more effective because, you know, as people heard last week, I came in guns a-blazing, ready to put the belt on Kakuta. And I, and I asked you last week, I said, is he Drangate Sami Zayn? Do we, you know, if the plan is for Shun to win, which we expect it to be, do we need to pivot and ride the lightning that is Madoka Kakuta right now? Where do you stand on that? I told you last week, I would ask you again this week. And so coming out of these Fukuoka shows, Mike, not who do you think will win, but who do you want to win coming out of Dead or Alive? I I want Kakuta to win. And it is, I I think there's a lot more interesting matchups for Kakuta, whereas Shun, I don't know if they really want to keep this heel run going past Kobe World, you know? So I, 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 I'm I, more interested after this week with what the future would be with, with Red Hot Madoka Kakuta as Dreamgate champion entering the hot season versus uh, the diabolical Shun Skywalker. I, I just kind of feel like that there's more out in front of him, I guess. Where are you at with this Shun Skywalker title run? Because I think un- universally, I, I guess I shouldn't say universally because there were some outspoken people against Shun last year, but for the most part, the people that watched Shun Skywalker thought he was one of the best wrestlers in the world last year. He won the Dreamgate Bell in January. I think really leaned in to a more methodical in-ring style, a little bit more character heavy, and he was already character heavy. We're three months into him as the Dreamgate champion. He's had the one defense versus Strong Machine J. On a scale of one to ten, what's your enjoyment level there? I would say probably a seven, but I was a nine for his first run. 
Okay, I, I, I'm at an 8. You know, I, I think it would have been at a 10 for most of last year with the work he was doing, a 9 or a 10 for his first Dream Gate run. I'm at an 8 here. I think, I think he's going to retain it dead or alive. I think he should retain at Dead or Alive coming out coming out of this weekend shows. You know, if Dead or Alive would have happened straight after the Kobe weekend, I would have said, fuck it, rip up the paper, Kakuta needs to win the belt. It's not that anything went wrong in Fukuoka. I thought the angle was great. I really enjoyed what they did, but it recalibrated me. I, I don't want to say cooled off because that's not fair to Kakuta. It's just another week passed, and I went, okay, Shun Skywalker's a champion. Shun Skywalker could be the champion. He had the weird defense versus Strong Machine J. I think he and Kakuta are going to knock it out of the park at Dead or Alive. I'm an 8 and could very easily see myself two weeks from now being at a 10. Yeah, and I wonder with this uh, second game. So the three-way went to a DQ because he was a special gref- referee. He did a slow count, and then he tried to chip. He He tripped up. Kakuda doing corner attacks. Kakuda lost it, attacked him. Shun Skywalker, who I guess was special timekeeper, called for the bell, called a DQ, and then turned to a Z. Bratz beat down on all of D Courage. They made into a five on three. Then it was uh, Dragon Die after a real quick five minute little, just really brawl and sprint stretch. Uh, got the win with the double cork uh, uh, Bible crucifix bomb variant there. Do you think it, it, your anticipation would have changed if they didn't? if they didn't go DQ into the obvious handicap match? No, because I liked the way it all played out. I thought it was very well done. As an overall segment, you know, I don't know if I could throw a star rating on it, but I, I thought everything hit, uh, including Dragon Daya being being the one to pin Hyo here, you know, getting the Dreamgate guys out of the fall, but still building up Daya for his Brave Game match. I, I At the very least, I thought it was super efficient and super effective. I, I, I liked all of this. I, the the Zebrats beat down in Kobe, that handicap match blew me away because I had such low expectations of that specific angle going into it. And then Kakuta went above and beyond. And I thought, oh my God, the, you know, the, the time to strike is now. He did nothing wrong. This angle did nothing wrong. It accomplished what it was supposed to. It's just merely that, you know, the, the calendar flipped over another week. And I, and now that I have that distance, I've gone, okay, you know, Shun, Shun should probably retain, but I'm not against them still leaning into Kakuta and the momentum that I, I think he still has. I mean, I felt like he was incredibly over on these shows as well. Yeah, he is, I, I would say, at least on these shows. And this was not a full roster. Uh, Doi wasn't there. Ultimo wasn't there. Ato wasn't there. He felt like the most over person on the show. Hey, real quick, do you think if Ato went to Gleet, it would make a difference? Initially, maybe like it would go up to 750. <laughs> maybe 800. <Do> you... <laughs> okay. Do you think T Hawk and Ata versus Lindemann and Erie? Does that draw a thousand fans to Cork and Hall? I don't think so. I no. don't think so either. No. I just have it... no reason to believe that you the strong funny? heart side can build that. I think Ata versus Lindemann could do over a thousand pretty easily. And I think once T Hawk and Erie get into that mix, there's 400, <laughs> there's 400 people that go, fuck it. I, I, uh, nah, I'm, nah, I'm good. Yeah. 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 They see Yamamura at the decks and they're like, I'm out of here. Does Ata versus Ashita do a thousand fans in Cork and Hall? Maybe. Not, yeah. n- not modern day Ishida. Yeah. But- yeah, Ashita being seconded by El Bendito doesn't doesn't do it for you. <laughs> and Harley Jackson, and don't forget Gringo Loco was su- was sacking him for a while too, just to make this unit make less sense. Look, I Gringo Loco is talented enough to work in Japan, and it, oh yeah, uh, should be in Glee. Glee is such a mess; they have all this talent at their disposal, and they just I they don't know what they're doing with it. Yeah, and it's not like they aren't throwing ar- money around. I mean, it's not uh, like... Uh, Ashita couldn't have come cheap. Well, I'm not even thinking about that. I'm thinking about they had a, they flew at least seven people in from Mexico just to work elite shows. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, like, it's not like those plane tickets are something that are cheap. Like, a lot of promotions have issues with that kind of stuff. Yeah, flew in seven people from Mexico that work for big lucha 
And I understand the whole point was like it's the it's the black generation takeover, but also no bandito who's the most over guy of of all of them and he's not in the unit but he's a part of big lucha he runs big lucha no uh, wow that's you know i hadn't even thought about just the the international fees that are there yeah buddy it doesn't make sense let me ask you a question uh as as we pivot back into dragon gate here i thought about this watching the decourage three way and maybe maybe that reveals my hand already and it's a question i'll pose to you if you could remove one person from Zebrats right now, make them a baby face, and put one person in Zebrats right now, make them a heel. Let's start with Zebrats. Who are you taking out of the unit and turning face right now? Diamante. I, I think that's my second pick, and, and no argument there. And it makes sense. The guy is gorgeous. The guy is talented. I think people want to cheer for him. I, I think that's a very safe bet. I, I'm ready for the Hyo baby face turn. He has he. he... He has had such like a charismatic run as a heel comparison to where he was at Mochizuki Dojo or where he was yeah. before the the Great Brain. Like seeing him now be able to take the babyface side would be interesting because he's a funny I'd, guy. He's funny. Like I think it works. I'd like to see him turn face, really, just so I can see him turn heel again. Because I think the second heel turn could be the the most maximum effective heel turn possible in the current context of dragon gate but i think he needs that time as a face first he needs to warm back up to people so we can break their hearts yet again oh yeah yeah no he needs to go be a third in a unit with yamato for two years yeah that's exactly it now if you could put one person in zebras right now who are you putting in entire roster is fair game yamato i want to, i no. i i love seeing almighty yamato and i think that there is a time i think the company's at a place where they can have their e their ace go heel and have that last big heel run i'd like to see what yoshioka looks like as a heel and and that is scatterbrain booking i wouldn't advise them doing it no, but wa no. watching watching him in the three-way match i file he it got away mad at kakuda F file it away it was one of those where I went, mm, there's something there. I'd like to see a little bit more of that. That was very interesting. This was a very interesting match. Yeah, and it, 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 the way that he fired off to Kakuda after he, Kakuda did the double chop to Daya that sent him down, he got mad. Like, seeing him as a unmasked heel, I think he has it. Like, And I think that now that he, he's not encumbered by a giant rubber mask, I think we can get some really good, like, just crazy facials from him. I completely agree. So, in terms of D-Courage versus Zebrats here, you know, obviously, like, like Mike said, you know, it was the three-way with D-Courage guys. They attack Hyo, becomes a handicap match, Zebrats versus D-Courage. Thought it was super successful. Really enjoyed this, and, I, and I'm, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go through Dead or Alive next week, but if I'm, if I'm not a 10 out of 10 for Skywalker versus Kakuta, I'm a 9.5. I'm very into the match itself, but I've really, really enjoyed the way they've gotten into this. Yeah, and they, they still do have the, those annoying uh, KBS Hall shows before. Oh, oh, damn. Maybe they can yeah, get that those are, the, those are the most, I said this last week, the most inconvenient shows of the year. A Kyoto doubleheader right before a big pay-per-view, it just does not mesh with my schedule. Hey, 5-3-2018. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's uh, the uh, the famous... OWE shows up in Dragon Gate tag match. We all go, oh, what's this? This is fun. And then a press conference three days later, she, so she was like, okay, not so even a real press conference. <laughs> not even like, like they didn't You're even right. a photo op. You're right. That's God. They didn't. You're right. It's just these, <laughs> these Chinese acrobats show up at Kyoto KBS hall, blow the roof off of the building. And she was like, okay, so I'm leaving and these guys are coming with me and we'll see you all later. And it's, it, so bizarre Cre credit Get to you mike you were you were you were the guy that had the scoop before anybody else yeah yeah and we saw what that got me what no wrestling observer or newsletter hall of fame ballot it, you, you know I, I i'm a 36 year old man I, I i've done a lot in those five years to probably get that i know alan it's not a black ball <laughs> all right well, well, well let's uh let's run down the results of uh the the first kyoto show real quick here uh, oh, uh, the the first Fukuoka show, yeah, yeah, that's right. what I meant. Yeah. So both of these shows, like the the one nice thing, especially since cheering crowds come back, easy watches across very, Fukuoka now. Very, very, and, 
and the crowds were good. I lo- it, it is something that I wonder how much that like the venue and COVID really kind of tainted it because it kind of reminded me what I did like the when they first went there. I was like, oh, this kind of reminds me of like a mini Cork and Hall like venue, and that feeling was back. Both these shows, I mean. I got through it, fast forwarding through intermissions under two hours. Uh, the afternoon show started with Natural Vibes versus the Old Heads. As they, they, they've been in so many different units together, these three guys: uh, Mochizuki, Kanda, and Horiguchi versus KZ Shimizu and Kame. Kame got the win on Horiguchi with the Jackie Knife cutback. They the crowd went wild for that Jackie Knife on that. Uh, ja- K- Kame's feeling it right now. Uh, that's, a, that's a guy who uh, had a very good weekend. Great week and sock up Jack. Uh, match two, the the Star Cross Lovers tag team Yamato and Don Fuji. You, you, you know that's my favorite impromptu tag team in this company, kids. Of course. Yeah, they went up against the Mochizukis and Don Fuji won with a Gato clutch on Junior after Junior missed a Hurricane kick and that it, it was seven minutes, but it was like the most compressed seven minute match that these four guys could have. I caught up on some New Japan over the weekend. And I, I've now seen enough Aussie Open and Goto and Yoshihashi to confidently say the Mochizukis are my tag team of the year through April 19th, 2023. And Mark Davis is still despicable. I like Aussie Open. Good team. N- they have not had as good of a year as the Mochizukis. I'm sorry. Yeah, they have not. No, I, I, I am totally with it. Uh, th- there was a moment where, Mochizu- where Mochi did the thumbs up like out of nowhere that it cracked me up in this. And that one, but that was neither here nor there. Uh, singles match. You know, you know what show. this was? You know what that was? Hmm. That was that was the touch football match of the night. But if they were playing touch football, like the scene in Wedding Crashers, where they all take it too seriously, that's what this match was. Oh, that's it. Absolutely, I'm with you on that. Uh, match three, singles match. Strong Machine J and Kota Minora. Kota Minora won with the gong. Up, uh, I, I I I don't want to get on one of our Minora tangents here, but is he actually over? Hmm. You have stumped me with this one because it's not the direction that I thought you were going in. And my my answer to that question, this is not good radio. I don't know. I don't I know think either. That, I think that is a really good question. I don't know. I really wonder because across Fukuoka, who were getting into Kame and Horikuchi in the closing stretch of that opener, into the seven minute uh car crash football game sat on their hands the entire time for this okay one. i i don't i don't know if that's fair because my comment was gonna be damn strong machine j is actually pretty over yeah no he was more over than Kota Minora by far in this match i really i and we'll talk about this with the evening show as well i really like strong machine j he was in my th- this was Okay, this is interesting, because this was my second best match of the weekend. I almost went notebook on this. I went three and three quarters. I thought it was excellent, but it was excellent off of the resilient Strong Machine J babyface performance. Okay, I just couldn't get over how slow it was and how Strong Machine J was great in it, but Kota Minora, I, I, I need some months away from this guy. I really do. I think you just had six months away from him. He did nothing from August through January. But he still was here. I want him to go hang out in Mexico for a while. This guy needs an excursion. I think he'd be he'd be so disgustingly over in Mexico. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I'm that's what he, he's the the money that he could make just on his entrance alone, doing the stripper gimmick and picking up the money. Oh my god, that'd be sickening. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, match four. I, I, hold on, I, I really, I, I don't have a ton to add here, but I just want to say I okay. really like this match. I thought it was, it was heavy hitter Minora, who you're, you're right, it was slow, but I thought it was Minora kind of dropping big bombs, in Strong Machine J taking hit after hit after hit, and it was just really well done. By the end of it, you know when he kicks out of, uh, I think it's the R three hundred one that he kicks out of because the Gong is the one that ended up beating him. A big pop from the Fukuoka crowd, and it, it made it clear, you know, a month and a half removed from Champion Gate in Osaka, yes, he lost that match, but he came out on the better end of that Champion Gate Dream Gate match. You know, the Strong Machine J is it, my, my big question coming out of this week, and I guess we can get into this here a little bit. What is his next step? You know, he's in a way he's in this this nest of natural vibes that I think does him a lot of favors, but I do think there is a ceiling to him in this unit, and we just saw him lose a 
Dreamgate match. So I don't know where he goes, but he's getting better and better and better. And I think he's getting more over as time goes on. He's in a really weird spot right now. Yeah. And it's something where like he has so many different limiter caps on him, you know, like he's limited by the fact that they want to stick at least at this time with him doing his dad's gimmick in a way like that. He, it, it, and it's always going to be like a reference point is, Oh, he's the mask son of the original mask man. You know, like there's that. And the fact that as you said, like natural vibes, it is like a comforting nest and it does bring young wrestlers to the next level, but it doesn't take them all the way. It hasn't even taken KZ all the way. And I, I, I see what you're saying. I don't know what that next step is, but I don't know if it's as much because of natural vibes or I still think the auspices of being strong machine J is the thing. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is for him. You know, I don't think he's ready to lead a unit, but no, I also, no. I, you know what his, he's, his push is so interesting. And that's why I really, you know, I, I want to know where he goes from here. And maybe it's maybe look, maybe he just wins the triangle gate belts at dead or alive. And he finds some stability there, but his push started with a dream gate loss. And so now everything after that is he's in this elevated state, but there's also very clearly a glass ceiling above his head. And I don't know, I don't know what it's going to take to break through on that. He's again, he's improving rapidly. He has this great singles match here with Menor. I thought he was excellent in this match, but where does he go next? Yeah. And I just don't know how you figure that out for him either, because I don't think that like leading a unit is not the answer for him. Maybe like, We'll, we'll get into this on on the night show. Maybe there's something there with him and JFK. Maybe there's something there that they could have him do before they're re- ready to break him away from natural vibes. He's only I, been in natural vibes for less than a year. Yeah, it was June, right? Right, yeah. yeah. It was coming off of the Okinawa. Not Okinawa, Sapporo weekend. Yeah, because it, it was the King of Gate finals in Cork, and that's when, they, that's when he joined up. Right, yeah. Uh, match four of the day show. Uh, we're seeing some more Rey de Parejas teams pop up on the show. Uh on this day with double dragons, dragon kid and dragon diet, defeating Jason Lee and Kaito Nagano. It was the DD DDT on Daya. And I, this was probably my favorite. No, I like the main event a bit more, but this was one of my favorite matches on this morning show, just because we got to see dragon kid just really like dismantle Kaito Nagano. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. I, I thought this match was just okay, but that also might just be a victim of my expectations. No, that's entirely fair because it was not like a Daya gun show. Not a whole lot of Brave Gate stuff, you know? No. So, yeah, no, I, I could totally see how that fell a little bit more flat for you. Uh, semi-main event, Gold Class, Hulk, Benke, Minorita versus Zebrats, Kai, Diamante, and Ishin. Ishin is back and he has a new move. It is what they're calling a modified uh, scrap buster, but what it really was was a it looked like a variant of his Kamada choke slam that he's able to do because uh, Minarita is so small. It's a fireman's carry into that slam. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to apologize. I was very hard on Ishan last week. I expressed severe concern over his character, over the way he was presenting himself, over his immediate future. Those concerns are no more. Ishan is back. I thought he was excellent here. I am back on the Ishan train. He was good on both shows. I, I very, think JF- yes, very much so. I think JFK, I think, is the MVP of Fukuoka, but he had, it, it is something he, uh, he, he took a left-hand turn when I was expecting him to continue doing his silent killer kind of thing. Yeah, he's not he, wearing, he, he he's removed not the mask the, anymore. The, he took off the mask. He removed the zombie nature of his character. He had much more intensity this weekend. This was a, a change in all the right directions. And he's getting thicker. Like, he is. He, yes, he is. Yeah, you know who he really reminded me of when I saw him like in his entrance. Who's that? He looked like a Higuchi Sito in the right kind of ways, as in Kazusada. Yes. Huh. Yeah. I had, yeah, I, yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. You know, I mean, yes, uh, yes. Uh, Koji Ishinriki was one of the smallest professional wrestlers in modern history but he still was a he still was a sumo wrestler he can get some weight on that body you yeah know? very much so yeah yeah and you know that was a i thought pretty solid semi-main event the main event uh dreamgate build yuki oshioka madoka kakuda versus shun skywalker and hyo 
Yuki Yoshioka won with the reversal Samson victory roll in 16 minutes. It was yet another Skywalker versus Kakuta match that made me really excited for their Dreamgate. So that is a, that is a successful main event in my book. Yeah, well, my only complaint was uh, this match, which three and a half. I thought no, nothing on these shows was bad. It just was that singles match did not do it for me. But my my one thing was I was wondering why they did the victory roll on Hio. Like, why did he need to get protected so much? Little did I know that he would be very involved and basically be penned very easily the next show yeah no this was it it was nice to see sort of some show to show booking here there are some guys that look good on on the first show and carried it over to the second one yep uh do you want me to start running down the night show please so the night show again 16th will be up until the 30th uh again this show actually was for for the people there that keep track of the story stuff this is like a rare time that the night show was shorter than the day show at Cross Fukuoka. Did you notice that? I did. And both of these shows, when you skip intermission, both of these shows are, I think, under two hours. They are very short. Oh, yeah. Easily under two hours. The, the opener of the, uh, the, the night show, and by the way, for this might be anyone's first show, for these network shows, the first matches are always available for free on YouTube, so you can go check it out. And this was a solid enough Dead or Alive Primer, I felt like, but kind of building up the uh, Triangle Gate match as you had the champion team, Kota Minor, BB Hulk, and Ben K of Gold Class versus KZ, Big Boss Shimizu, and Jason Lee. It was Shimizu cracking back to Team Boku with a La Maestra Cradle on Hulk. Fun opener. Good stuff here. Yeah, I thought it was fun. And it continued into what I thought was a hot little f- under five minute match between Hyo and Minorita. Uh, Hio won with a Bobby Hill special. He distracted the wrath, told him, give me back my purse. I don't know. You kicked him, scrawl on the groin, rolled him up there to get the win. I really enjoyed This was pretty motivated Hio here. Yeah. It, every once in a while, we get these Hio matches where it kind of works with the intensity of like the four pillars of all Japan. And this was one of those where he was hitting Minorita really hard. He was dropping him on his head. And and you're right. You know, this was this was motivated Hyo. This was Hyo looking for work rate and not necessarily an angle. And that's not who he is. That's not who he needs to be. But when he shows it, I always really enjoy it. Yeah, five minutes. I love a five minute match, guys. As, as do I. As do as we all should. Uh, next match, we have a new tag team: Yamato and Kaito Nagano going up against Kai and Ishin. Ishin pin Nagano with the Kamada choke slam. I. I really thought Nagano, who has been has been hit and miss, a little shaky at times, real strong day for him in front of his hometown. Do you have a whiteboard in your new place? Because I have an idea. Not yet. Oh, me and Kings have been looking at whiteboards. <laughs> have fun with that. Okay, <laughs> let me speak this into existence. On a slow week, chemistry power rankings. Because I All think... Right. I think we need to celebrate the chemistry that Kai and Kaito Nagano have with one another. It, it is, I have in my notes, professional fucking chemistry between Kai and Kaito Nagano. Obviously, Nagano is from here. He is essentially the Fukuoka equivalent of what Daiki Yaganayuchi is in Tokyo. He had his debut match against Kai, one of my favorite debut matches of all time. And every time they are in the ring with one another, those two guys get each other. It's a little bit like... You know, Kai, even when I wasn't in love with him, he always had great chemistry with UT, and I always shouted that out when I could. It's the same thing with Nagano. I, I think he it, the size difference really plays to his strengths, even when he was not uh, up to speed in the Dragon System style. Yeah, look, you would have no idea. If you started watching Dragon Gate today, you would have no idea that Kai is a Mudo disciple who comes from old Puro logic, who for years and years struggled, in my opinion, adapting to the Dragon Gate style. Because once he figured it out, this guy is so in tune with the beats and rhythms of this promotion. And this was, I look, I love this match. I put three and a half stars on it. It, it was it was Kai and Nagano going after it, and then Ishin showing some fight. And I haven't been getting that from Ishin since he came back in March. You know, he he was off February. He had this zombie gimmick that is just, or I'm sorry, he was off in March, came back in April. Just that that presentation was not doing anything for me. And then he showed up here, 
and was acting like he was mad at people, was acting like he was angry, was acting like he was a professional wrestler, and all of a sudden it started working again. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it, it's something where I did like the zombie gimmick to an extent, but some of that was also my own mind canon of thinking like, oh, he's actually doing devil vow to cause when that, who knows what his motivation truly was. But this is just yeesh and getting after it. And that's been a real fun thing to see. Match four was an eight man tag. It was the entire complement of M3K. Masaki, Mochizuki, Susumu, Mochizuki, Azushi, Kanda, and Mochizuki Jr. Versus the... Real, real, uh, like legends of a of a company. Don Fuji, Dragon Kid, Geeky Horiguchi, and Komao Ichikawa. It's listed as a Boston Crab. However, the reality was Susumu Mochizuki was basically using uh Komao Ichikawa as a shoulder weight when he tried to go for a Hurricane Rana, trying to right after Dragon Kid did one. Instead, he got. It looked like he was gonna get power bombed to try to fight out and. Susumu just sat on him. He just sat on Koma, which is case. It was it was a sight to see. Fun was had by all, with the exception of Konamami Ichikawa. A tough night for him. I, I like the fact that like Ichikawa was taken out immediately in this match, and then Fuji and Junior brawl to the back, so it became a three on two essentially. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah, and, and it was something that during that three on two, you the, the look in Ginky's face, w- w- one of the one of the greats, just one like greats. like one of the greats, just going, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the the semi main event of Fukuoka was my match of the weekend. It was Strong Machine J and, and Jackie Funky Kame versus Shun Monte, Shun Skywalker and Diamante. They put Kame into the dirt with the Cielo finale in fourteen minutes. I really think Strong Machine J and Jackie Funky Kame might be the next step forward for both guys. That, that might be it. You know, this was my match of the weekend as well. I, I didn't love the finish of this. If the finish was just a little bit hotter, I would have got notebook on it, but I was being a little stingy, decided to uh, to keep it at three and three quarters. But you might be right. You know, with Jason holding the Brave Gate belt and hopefully holding the Brave Gate belt for a long time, because again, I, can think, I, I think he can have a POC level Kaito Ishida level run with that title if he's given the opportunity. Kame and, and Strong Machine J, that's that's good energy right there. That's very good natural vibes. It's a, a, a power junior combination there. There's a lot you can do with those guys. And specifically, hey, run back this match in a bigger building. Run back this match with a better setting. And I think you have magic on your hands here because you know you really enjoyed Kame this weekend. To me, this was one of the banner weekends for Strong Machine J, you know, four years after his debut. We really saw him put it together as like a, hey, this guy isn't just good. This guy isn't just underrated. This is a guy that can carry some weight on his shoulders and really deliver when the time comes. I had two, uh, both of his matches this weekend at three and three quarter stars. I was four flat on this. I did go notebook. And a lot of that was that the first like seven minutes of this was just an incredible Jackie Funky Kame baby face in peril. Like just getting destroyed and keeping the crowd in it. The crowd was so engaged in this by the end of it that it was something that I thought was pretty special. Yeah, you run this back in Cork and you run this back in even Osaka number two and just imagine the response there because the crowd was into it here. You know, obviously Shun is the Dreamgate champion right now, so this isn't going to happen anytime soon. But I, I, I was just thinking about when Shima and Dragon Kid held the Twin Gate belts and they had those two matches. It was KZ and Yosuke Santa Maria. They challenged for the belts. And then it was KZ and Hulk challenging for the belts. And they lost both those matches. But I like that, you know, KZ was kept in the mix, but basically upgraded his partner in that second challenge. And that should be at some point the goal of, of Shun and Diamante and Kame is you run Shun and Diamante versus Kame and Jason. And you run Shun and Diamante versus Kame and, and Strong Machine J. And you run Shun and Diamante versus Kame and KZ. And I, I think you run the gambit of, of natural vibes versus Zebrats in, in that setting. I think there's a lot of good that can come from that. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. Uh, and then the main event was the SS Quest second game, the three way Yoshioka, Dai, and Kakuda going to a DQ. And Hio got attacked as the referee. Then the impromptu three on five match that we talked about a little earlier. Daya winning with the double cork Bible variant on Hio. Real, 
real fun uh, Fukuoka shows. I, I'm starting to come around on Fukuoka, and I think that is because the crowds can. Yeah, no, the, these shows are a lot more lively than they were in, in you know, 2020 and 2021 when I thought largely the company was cooking, but Fukuoka would always cool things off a little bit. I, you know, we did not spend a lot of time talking about these shows because I want to talk about Glee, want to talk about Genki Horiguchi, but these were fun shows. And again, under two hours on both of them, if you jump around to the network, there's no reason you can't sit down and knock these out. They, they're a lot of fun. Yeah, no, and it's something where I think it with the crowds coming back and everything with this, and I think that, I again, it's no Star Lanes. There will never be another Star Lanes, but I this venue could have potential, I feel like. I, I just wonder if it's ever going to make sense for them to treat it like how they would treat Hakata in the past. I, I would I would like for them to. I'd like to have, uh, if they're not going to run Osaka frequently, which they, they certainly, and, and maybe in my mind, they just used to run Osaka way more, but they're not there a lot now. And thus, this you know this is an important building for them. So the, the more care and the more focus they can show in Fukuoka, the more it is appreciated on my end. And the last bit of bigger Dragon Gate news coming out of this weekend, we had a match update for Dead or Alive. Wanted to touch on this before we get into the card more in depth next week. But a UT's comeback match has been decided. This kind of the pieces kind of made sense that that he would be teaming with Jackie Funky Kame given what the rest of Fives are doing at Dead or Alive. But they will be going up against Kagatora and Kaito Nagano and UT's comeback match in his hometown in Nagoya. This will be the opening match. It will be on YouTube. We'll talk about it more next week, but I, I want to at least mention that UT is back. He has a match booked, and I think it's going to be good stuff. Yeah, no, UT versus Nagano. That is an exciting thing to think about. Well, that's what I'm trying to remember now. When did when did UT get hurt? He was out. Okay, so he's been in the ring with Nagano. He's been in the ring with Nagano before he's been on the same team as him. Okay, he's been on the same team as Kaito Nagano once. He has not wrestled him in a match. So that is the, that is the first time pairing there. That's exciting. Oh, that's fun. I did not know that. But Case, do you have anything else you wanted to touch on before we wrap things up this week? Next week, we will be previewing Dead or Alive. That's, I guess, that's my last thing here is next week, previewing, uh, previewing Dead or Alive. Mike and I are going to try to do same day audio of Dead or Alive on May 5th. So, you know, watch that show live or right after it drops on the network. And hopefully we'll have some audio for you by Friday night or Saturday morning. Uh, and and like I said during the show, uh, Genki Horiguchi, the, the article is uh, Hage, the enduring legacy of Genki Horiguchi and the backslide from heaven. That will be up on VoicesOfWrestling.com. It should be 10 Eastern time on Friday. I really encourage people to sit down and give that a read uh, because I'm proud of it. And there's a lot of people that have very interesting, very profound opinions on Genki Horiguchi's career, plus quotes from Genki himself. Yep, it's going to be real special. Keep an eye out for that. But that's going to do it for us this week on Open the Voice Gate. Thanks for listening. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. Cases underscore in your case. I'm at Fuchiheya. And while you're on the internet, go to wherever you get your podcasts, especially if it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, and rate and review us. It's the best way for people to find out about the show. But that's going to do it for us this week. Until next time, take care, everyone. Hola, hola, my name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí. Hey everybody, my name is Jesse Collings and I want to tell you all about my show, The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. On The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, we do a thorough analysis on the biggest issues and trends within the pro wrestling industry. We talk a lot about pro wrestling media, we talk a lot about fan culture and wrestling's place within general pop culture, and we talk about the broader influences that are shaping the way we discuss and analyze the pro wrestling industry. 
We've had some of the brightest minds in the pro wrestling intelligentsia on the show, including WrestleNomics host Brandon Thurston, both Rich Critch and Joe Lanza from the Flagship Wrestling Podcast, Trevor Dame from the Through the Years Podcast, and a whole lot more. This isn't a show for hot takes. It's not a show recapping the latest episode of television. This is a show focusing on the biggest topics in pro wrestling and doing a deep dive on the real stories behind the surface level analysis you might find elsewhere. The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a try. Thanks.